very very happy to have um, uh, Mrs. Kumari Shibulal and Shruti Shibulal with uh, me here. Um, it's going to be uh, an amazing session because uh, uh, you know they come from a family uh, that does uh, a myriad, I think, lines of social work, and each of them has their sort of pet areas as well. But they all sort of also work together under one common umbrella. So. um you know it's exciting to have you thank you so much and um, to start with i mean uh, if i can start with uh, uh, kumari ji i mean can you tell us a little bit about you know why did you start what what was the reason uh, for you to feel motivated for you to feel like you had to do this um and sort of what got this journey uh, started yes hey, um the uh, education and healthcare as a primary focus uh, focus in the philanthropic uh, journey uh, in our life and uh, why education um, we believe that uh, because of the education that we received that is the reason we are here today and uh, healthcare uh, one of our children had some health issues uh, long back and uh, we got it resolved because we had money and uh, we were in us at that time so we were thinking about uh, that you know um, what happens to a child in india and who does not have money how will he survive so that is the reason we started the healthcare program would it be okay for us to say that you started off feeling that you know a sense of empathy that if my child is going through this you know what about other children who don't have the same means so you started with healthcare and then you kind of branched out into other areas amma can i just but to go back to why you like why you wanted to work in education it's because of your own sort of background with education in terms of your village and you being the first in your family in your village first girl in your village to go to college yeah okay and the opportunities that were given to you i think you had a scholarship right that was given to you for 2000 yes yeah i i actually you know i like i told you, you know so education is the one brought us over here all uh, you know so that's what i told you and then my background is i came from a very small village in kerala and at those times not many children go to school you know so during the harvest time and all that the school is completely uh, you know almost empty you can say that type of a situation but my parents insisted that i go to school and study so i was the i was the first one of the first ones to go to college from my village and i was getting a scholarship from the government till uh, 10th grade and even after that also when i was in the school i was getting a scholarship and then after uh, in the college also i was getting the scholarship so i was the first one to go to college from my uh, village so in a way sort of you know the privilege that you got and the opportunity that you got is something that you wanted very much to pass on and yes. other children and other people as well so uh, uh, kumari ji just just a quick question on you know so you spoke about how you started with health and sort of moved on to education and in education you had a very quick realization that something was not right with the sos model and so you started the schools yourself yes uh, uh you know at what point i mean did you have sort of a clear strategy from the very beginning or did it sort of uh, you know evolve as you um, sort of went along actually the scholarship program uh, we never thought it will scale up like this okay so we, we you know first we started with two children from the school where she do studied and then over the years you know it became 4 and 10 and uh, all that and it became 100 uh, you know so we started in kerala and then we thought uh, you know we will start in other states also but we were getting uh, for about 100 seats and so we get about 10000 10 to 15000 applications that means that much of need in our country in you know every state it is the same story now we have it about 14 states and for the 14 states uh, we get uh, uh well, i i don't know more than uh, uh, more than 45000 uh, applications we get in the uh, and in each state we take 100 students but still in the challenge is how to say no to those students because everybody is equally needy and this, the criteria for getting the uh, scholarship is first is the means and then the merit right so that is the criteria for getting the scholarship right but 
you know, they are they are all equally uh, eligible students and deserving. So, yes, yeah, equally deserving students. So last ten years back, we started a program called Each One Teach One. So we ask uh, individuals and uh, corporates to sponsor one child each. So that way we are getting a lot of response like that. You know? So a lot of youngsters and a uh, you know, lot of corporates and you know, they, are, they are sponsoring a lot of children. Right. So I, think, I just, I'm going to make a quick um, sort of uh, detour to Shruti. Um, Shruti, I mean, uh, you know, your parents seem to have been doing this for a few years now and you seem to have grown up with this you know, uh, with this philosophy sort of in the background, what are some of your earliest like recollections of philanthropy or how this idea came to be? And I'm sure you were part of, you know, you were probably much younger. Um, but so what are your earliest recollections and what is it that you take from, uh, you know, your earliest memories of this? So my mom used to tell me the story about her mother and how even when there was hardly any food in the house, if somebody came to the house asking for food, she would take the food that was meant for her and, and give it away. Right, Ma? Yeah. So it was, you know, I think culturally and like, you know, from a family tradition, there is this very deep sense of giving back. And, you know, from a, uh, from a really early age, I think that was always sort of the way that we did things, right? So even when it came to like giving your toys away um, when you were really little, you know, when you had finished using them, you know, as much as maybe my brother and I <laughs> didn't like doing it, like we still, you know, we still did it. And, um, and I think it was very much encouraged that you, you share uh, what you have, right? And I think we also came into a very privileged position at some point in our lives when we were quite young. And, um, and we knew, you know, we saw a lot of what my parents were doing. Right. So I remember, for instance, like the first scholarship that was given at my dad's uh, tiny little school um, in Alapi, like we were, you know, my brother and I were there. We met the kids, you know, who were receiving the scholarship, um, you know, and we, we saw like where they were, you know, where they had come from. And, and honestly, we've seen where they've gone as well, right, over the years. So I think that, you know, it's been, you know, we've been very close to it, I think, over the years, right, in terms of witnessing what my parents' intentions were and how they were able to create, like, real impact, uh, deep impact with the philanthropy that they have done and the, the programs that they have created. Um, so even like the uncle program that my mom mentioned and the one that, you know, she was looking there, you know, they were looking, they had to look at an adaptation, um, from the original, you know, from the SOS program and stuff like that. Like, I mean, the kids, uh, were originally housed in these, um, these homes that we had created, uh, actually around our neighborhood. So I used to spend a lot of time with these little kids, you know, just playing with them and kind of, you know, and talking to them and stuff like that. So it's, it's been you know, it's always been there, like for several, several years, like we, it's always been around us and, and sort of imparted to us. And, and I think there's a sense of responsibility in us as we've grown older, that we should continue on in this legacy of um, giving and in sort of upholding the good work that has been done, you know, and, and the intentions behind it. So in a way, the a, a legacy, which means not just being successful in business, but also the good work that was started, right? That's a very important aspect, I think, of what you're trying to say. And not to everybody, but it, it is unique in that there is no um, primary family business, right? We're not really, a, we're not a family business family. We've created lots of platforms of business over the years, each one of us in the family has. Um, but this is really, in that case, the family legacy, right? The philanthropy. And that's why there is sort of a name for it. Even we're, you know, it's called the Shibalal Family Philanthropic Initiatives. Um, but this is the legacy and and it should outlive all of us. It should last for generations. That's the way it's been built as well. And that's the way that it's being considered and looked at, right? It's not um, just a building, for instance, which of course there is value in, you know, funding a building being built, but these are actually platforms that we hope will really serve uh, the greater good and have real purpose to them. As, uh, you know, uh, different members of the family are involved, what would you say are individually, what is it that each one brings or what is each one's, for example, what is Shruti's areas of interest? What does she bring to the table saying, this is what I want done? Or what is your... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so, I mean, 
you know, my parents are still very much the head of this, right? I, it's, you know, and it, because it's not, I mean, the businesses are different, right? Like, you know, I have my own business and each one of us has our own, you know, in my generation, we each kind of have our own thing that we do. But from the family uh, philanthropy perspective, it's still very much run by my mother and supported by my father. That's the way that it's kind of, and they both, I mean, they bring tremendous amount to it, right? And they're also the ones who, are, I think, the you know, they're the drivers behind it, right? So my mom is the one who, like she said, she's heavily involved into each of the initiatives. And my dad brings a lot of the technology uh, background to building these platforms. Um, I think in my generation, we are supportive in the sense that we're involved, we're learning, we're there. But in in terms of like the larger decision making, I would still say it's very much with them. And I and it's not sort of, you know, there's not that many cooks in it, you know, in the kitchen in that sense, right? It should be them. At some point, maybe it will get, you know, passed down like however they want to do it. But at this point, it is still mainly them in terms of these larger initiatives. Um, I do want to say one thing though. It is not, I mean, we are very much an oper operational sort of um foundation. In a sense that we, you know, we have these initiatives, which um, we very much run, but with, you know, even within that, there are parts of it that we are able, you know, each one of us individually is able to grow. Like, so for instance, I started an initiative within our own, our foundations called Sapia a few years ago, and that was based on, uh, you know, a passion of mine. Uh, yeah. So that was created within the philanthropic sort of the network. Um, and then, you know, Amma says we don't write checks, but we do support other organizations as well, not to the extent which I think many other large philanthropic, you know, known philanthropic organizations do. But and that's because, you know, our core sort of, you know, this idea of healthcare and education, you know, we, you know, we do it very well and we, you know, we're really you know, set on expanding that as well. But um, there are a number of initiatives that we have supported um, and some are driven by individual choices and some are, you know, driven by sort of group choices. So I think like, for instance, something that my mom and I- It's safe to say that, you know, you guys uh, sort of uh, run and uh, sort of spearhead and run programs that you all do really well, but where you feel that you're able to support someone else, you do give money to them just so as to expand your sort of the horizon, expand, you know, whatever work is being done, right? Exactly. Yeah. So a tree for an instance is a, one of the leading environmental think tanks, think tanks in the world. My parents started supporting a tree, I think several years ago. Um, there's a women's organization that, you know, we've been supporting called women's education project for many years. There's um, you know, there's a organization called Olympic gold quest, which, um, you know, works in the sports arena, which is related to the work that my husband does, for instance, that we support. Um, so I think, you know, these are these are sort of minor in a sense, but we, you know, they are, the, I think we do have those instances as well, where we do support these external organizations that we feel are really the creating. Giving, they kind of tie into the larger giving philosophy, right? Even though they may not be large projects, I think it sort of unifies um all the work that you do in terms of philosophy and giving and what you think is important and why it's important. Yeah, I mean, but again, I think the core vision for my parents, and Amma, you can please step in and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but, you know, I, we do feel that education um, and healthcare are, are very primary, I think, in this at this point in our country. Yeah. Um, to really to to create impact, right? I mean, these like my mom said, like we she's witnessed the power of education and how that can transform lives, you know. And so most of our focus goes into these areas. Healthcare is the same thing. I mean, you know, you have to have good health and you have to survive right. um, in order for you to uh, you know live any sort of a fruitful life. And so, yeah. So that's where it's all kind of based and started and that's where you know a lot of the the time and effort and energy and money goes um but there is sort of uh space for all of us to kind of put in little bits and pieces beyond that as well kumariji i mean uh you know uh you said that you started with health and then moved on to education um you know and shruti mentioned too that you know you all do give um you know other causes as and when you see that you know uh they can benefit from it and you're able to have a wider reach um, 
So clearly you have a much more hands-on approach to things than a checkbook sort of approach. Um, that's sort of very clear. Uh, can you tell me a little bit perhaps, I mean, how do you uh, I think, uh, for example, that this is what we will do and this is something that we may not be able to do. So what is, how do you strategize in that sense? Someone approaches us and so a lot of it, and wherever we are sponsoring and are supporting them, so maybe it is non people or somebody they are known by someone else that we know that you know they are doing the, doing a great work. So those kind of individuals and uh, NGOs that we are supporting, actually, uh, this uh, for example, the mantra for change. Uh, so when they approached us many years back, you know, so we had no idea how um, how they are working. But uh, one of uh, Shibu's colleagues, you know, so they knew them very well and they knew the work what they are doing. So that is how we started working with them and they are doing a wonderful, uh, wonderful job. Uh, so they are expanded so much after that, you know, after our sponsorship and they are getting another sponsors also now. Then another project is uh, we call this uh, um, uh, a program called Venda by Fourth Way Foundation that is uh, in uh, Kanarka and uh, this Venda program in um, Kerala. So that is for the substance abuse in, in, uh, in uh, between the children and the uh, transporting and the substance abuse. So that also, that person knew Shibu somehow and she approached us and then by talking to her, uh, you know, so we came to know that uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of people talk about them and then uh, we had the trust in them and then we started supporting them. Even though we, uh, you know, it is a, you know, writing check process, I review with them every, every month. Uh, every month I review with them and then, you know, sometimes I give them advices and, you know, and uh, they have programs for mothers. You know, they are the one taking care of the children and uh, so now how to, you know, control these children and how to know about these children and all that. Now they have different programs for mothers other than the children. So they, they kind of educate the children as well as rehabilitate the children and all that. So those, those kind of things I do. Now this is kind of a, even though it is called a lot of program, you know, so I am kind of get involved in it. You know, so whenever, wherever, wherever we are there. Uh, also, Kumari ji, uh, what is the what are some of the ways in which you sort of measure impact? I imagine that you probably have different strategies for your own projects and for those where you sort of just give a check or you are part of it but not as deeply involved. Um, can you tell me uh, what the various strategies are, both for your own and for other NGOs? Yes, our own uh, thing, actually, this Vidyadhan program, we started in 1999. It's, uh, now it is about uh, almost 23 years now. So all the years, you know, so we could see that visually, you know, what is happening in their life. You know, so we can keep contact with all those children. Okay. So we did an impact study. And it says that, uh, you know, after they finish their studies, and they get a job for sure in two and a half because they, they are all very smart children. So they get a job immediately and within two and a half years, their economic level will go up. So they will be in the BPL level when they get the job and within two and a half years, so they'll be out of the BPL level. So that is the, that is the impact study that we could do. But some of it, you know, some of the social changes, you know, it will take a long time. Absolutely. Very, very long time. So we have to be patient. You know, we have to be very, very patient to, uh, for that. So I did just a quick uh, sort of a bit of a detour, but a lot of organizations come in talking about impact and numbers, and this is our number for the year and so on. Uh, what is one piece of advice perhaps that you can give to someone who's constantly sort of saying, here are number crunching, here's a number crunching system and here are impact for the year. Um, what is something that you'd like to say? You need to get deeper into it because I, I think um, you really have to just ask a lot of questions and get deeper and deeper and deeper and really think through the model, right? With And try to understand it. Um, I, I have an example of this, this uh, skilling is so my, you know, the initiative that I mentioned before Satya works in skilling, essentially. On the face, that's what it looks like. Um, you know, there's a huge number of skilling institutes in this country. And actually there's a lot of data available. If you look at the data, it looks very, very positive. What 
you realize when you look at it a little bit more closely is that all of that data is essentially data for three months after a a person has graduated from the Skilling Institute, which means that they've been employed for three months. It says nothing to, you know, to say that have they stayed employed? Have they remained in the same industry? Have they moved on to something else? Even six months after all that money has gone into ensuring that they are skilled in a specific vocation. That's not, I mean, is that real impact? Are we, you know, is the impact of all of that, or that we, that, you know, all that energy and effort, is it really just for three months? It, you know, it seems unlikely. So there was actually a, a, an organization um, which did, you know, which looked back 10 years, and this is a very large skilling organization. And they realized that their impact was 7% unlike the 98, 97% that at three months, over 10 years, it was 7%. And they completely pivoted and they started looking at it, in, you know, very, very differently. But that's because, you know, they had the the willingness and, you know, to change. So anybody, I would say, if you're getting, you know, if numbers are getting thrown at you, please just look at it closer, like talk to them, understand it better. Um, it takes a bit of effort but it is uh, it is incredibly important. Um, and unfortunately, I do think the other side of this, of this is that the NGOs are also forced into a position to, to be showing impact uh, in a way which is not necessarily the best way, right? So like my mom was saying, a lot of impact is not short-term. And so if a funder goes in saying, we need to see a million people impacted in six months, it, you know, sometimes that's not the best place to put your money into, right? I mean, impact, you know, takes time sometimes to like real deep impact. And so funders also have to be very um, clear about what is it that they want their money to do um, and really try to find nonprofits that are aligned to that philosophy. I think I agree with Kumari Ji, and I think the operative word really is patience. Um, you know, and yes, we 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 do operate like a lot of businesses operate in terms of, you know, in terms of structure, in terms of processes, in terms of impact. But a lot of those take a lot longer than businesses, right? And they you kind of have, have to have a, a, a slightly different approach to them. Um, Kumari Ji, if I can ask you a, to speak a little bit about so um, uh, you do also work with the government is what I sort of, uh, I got that from you earlier that you work with the government as well uh, in your education uh, initiatives. Can you tell me a little bit about what kind of partnership uh, uh, opportunities you've had with the government and what kind of partnerships you've actually sort of gone, gone through with? Actually, uh, so uh, for example, for these uh, Vidyathan programs to introduce into a new state, we need to uh, work with the government to you know the government have officials has to agree with us you know so the same idea whether uh, we can introduce that to you know so it takes some time but uh, we need to make them understand that what we are doing and um, all those things you know? so once that is done you know that, that that will work but the thing is it will take some time uh, to make them understand and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, what happens is that they will get transferred and uh, that will be another challenge. So even the Shiksha Lokam also, they, they are also facing the same thing, you know. So they will be, you know, convincing one government official for some time and they get transferred, the other person come and they may, may not agree with uh, all those things. And it will take time. But we have to work with the government. Otherwise, we cannot introduce these things to uh, anywhere. Can you tell me a little bit about your Edumentum? Uh, I understand that you have a program called Edumentum. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the idea, I think, also just to build on that is that they essentially, uh, you know, there's so many nonprofits working in the space of education. And I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, they also work specifically in the areas of whole school transformation, similar to what Mantra for Change um, has been doing, right? And so we were, we knew Mantra for Change and um, through that realized that this ecosystem is actually really rich, but there was no platform that was bringing all of these people together to share, to collaborate, to uh, learn from each other. So Edumentum is a way in which uh, batches of NGOs can get together who are working in this sort of shared space and they can, they go through classes, they, you know, they share their, their knowledge, they present together. 
Um, and they essentially, it, they grow. So it's sort of like a typical incubator accelerator that you would see in the um, for-profit space, but in the nonprofit space specifically for this, uh, you know, this field of uh, nonprofit. Um, so, I mean, uh, Edumentum sounds also like, uh, uh, you know, you, you are able to um, understand then what areas of expertise, uh, you know, different NGOs are able to bring in and sort of also understand, you know, where they can fit in, what kind of loopholes they're able to plug and so on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds really interesting. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, perhaps some projects that didn't pan out or work out as you envisaged? And, uh, you know, maybe I'd, I'd actually like some hard truths about what your learnings were from something like that. Because I think uh, a lot of people expect that, you know, we know what we're doing and we get into it and it, it always ends up, you know, being hunky-dory and amazing. Uh, but uh, I do understand that, you know, there are roadblocks and there are disappointments. So uh, if you could tell me a little bit about something that didn't pan out and what your learnings were from those. It is our Ankur program. So, so how we thought was, uh, you know, we will have the school, uh, the Samhita Academy, and we will have 20% of the students from the um, underprivileged background. And uh, so over the years, uh, you know, we will self-sustain. Self I just want to make one, I just want to add, this is before RTE. Yes, yeah. yes, it was before RTE. So we started the school and the children were in and everything, but the, you know, it was not a self-sustainable, self it is not a sustainable model at all. Because to run a, a you know, a high class school, the expenses are so much. And to run a hostel for these children in, like in our mind. So our school hostel, this Angur hostel is like one of the international uh, models actually. So I went to one of the international schools and got the idea of how to run the hostel and all that. So that is I got this. But they have all the care work is needed for a child who is bringing up in our own home. Now, so those, those kind of a quality, we need uh, uh, you know, a lot of expenses. So it did not work out. So we thought First, we thought when we made this school and the hostel, we thought it would be a model for everyone, uh, you know, everyone, and we can ask someone to do that, but it is not working out. Absolutely. Um, and I really, I hear you on that because we work on education as well, and we're constantly sort of um, hitting a wall, both of expense, of mindset, of, like you said, government officials being transferred. Um, um, so that's really interesting. Uh, also, Mr. Shibulal, if you can tell me, um, you know, uh, uh, how does your uh, organization, so what is the sort of the funding structure? Is it only family money? Do you have other donors who are giving to you? And how do you structure uh, your NGO? Actually, other than Vidyathan, everything is funded by us. All the, all our program. Vidyathan, I told you over the years, the last 10 years back, we decided, you know, so our money will get over, you know, so when we sponsor, you know, all these many uh, children. So we thought there will be another people, you know, another person who is out there who wanted to uh, sponsor a child, to educate a child, and they may not know how to do about it, you know, so they may not be able to trust anybody, anybody you know, they can give the money. Right. So that started asking uh, the people and uh, so there are so many people are sponsoring children and so that is the only place uh, the other's money is coming in but it is not coming to our foundation it is going directly to the child's account so we will select the child and uh, we will be it will be in the platform and they can they can select whoever they wanted to because they you know the fee structure is different you know? so we don't instruct the children what subject to take and what subject not to take and all that, whatever they are eligible. Because, uh, you know, they're all very smart children. So there will be about, uh, you know, many, I think about 500 doctors and 400 engineers and, you know, that many uh, nurses and all sorts. So they're all professionals and their fees, fee structure is different. So the sponsors, they are the one deciding whom to sponsor. Right. So they will, they will uh, you know, uh, take the child and then we will 
we'll give them all the information for the bank account, the child's bank account, and all the details. And they will transfer the money. So it is not coming to the foundation at all. So that is the only place we are taking, not we, you know, so we are asking someone to uh, put the money in. Absolutely. I just want to add the commitment of the donor in our Vidyadan program is for the entire duration of that child's education. The idea being that, that, you know, the child is not, or actually at that point an adult, but they are not, uh, you know, looking for money every year to continue on with their education. So if I select a student when that person is entering, let's say medicine first year, then my commitment is actually for seven years. Or if it's engineering, it's likely for six years or, you know, so on and so forth. So the, um, you know, the, the, the connection between the donor and the donee is actually really strong. And so, and we also encourage them to be in touch talk to each other, mentor, um, you know, there's, uh, a, we get a lot of volunteers to actually run training programs for our students, whether it's, uh, you know, interview prep or just, you know, life skills training, uh, things like that. So it's, um, it's, it's a pretty vibrant, you know, community of uh, donors, volunteers, and students. Right. Um, so, um, I mean, either of you, Kumari Ji or Shruti, um, what is something, what's a piece of advice that you'd give to uh, an individual who's just wanting to start their giving journey? Um, and it's probably not very sure whether to, to get into it, not get into it. I mean, what is one piece of advice you'd give them? You need to start early. The giving, you need to start early. And uh, how to choose is, you know, so it should be something you are uh, passionate about or you have some experience in it. So that way, you know, uh, the income will be more and you can uh, do that. So that is, um, you know, because in life, you know, so we will have so many needs. You know, we have to educate our siblings and make a house, buy a car and all those things will be there. There is no end to that. But if you keep everything, about, you know, in that line, so you won't be able to do anything. But the earlier you start, that is the better. And you can see the fruits also. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, Shruti, if... No, I just completely agree with my mom. I think, you know, especially as, um, you know, it's so heartening to see like college students raising money and volunteering their time. And, you know, it's a really beautiful thing to see. And so that if we can continue that sort of culture of philanthropy from a young age, um, you know, and I think, you know, we've, as a, as a society, we've evolved, right? I think back in the day, uh, philanthropy was sort of, you know, contributing to somebody's, uh, you know, if they're getting married, like, you know, you as a community, like even as part of the village, you sent, you give something, I guess, right? And more sort of individualistic. And so um, now I think the way in which philanthropy happens is different, but I, I completely agree with my mom. Like if you can find something that connects deeply with you, um, and, you know, find a way to share not just your money, but, and, you know, your time, but also your expertise, then it's a wonderful, um, way to have fulfillment in your life. And then to, you know, further role model to others as well. Actually, what, one thing my mom touched upon briefly, but each one teach one, that program within the Vidyadan scholars, uh, what happens is actually our students, they are encouraged to become a donor when they are able to. So we've had several kids who have come from low income backgrounds who have you know, studied, gotten good jobs, and then eventually come into positions after they've you know, taken care of their siblings' education, built their parents a house, all of that, where they become donors for the next generation of scholarship receivers. And so that's you know, that's, that's an amazing testimony um, to the culture of philanthropy that I think we want to see. Sustainable otherwise. Um, just one last question, Kumari Ji. It's been a wonderful conversation. My biggest takeaway today, I think, uh, from you is don't just write a check, be involved. Um, I think the power and the sort of the, the happiness and satisfaction you get from that is immense and irreplaceable, inexplicable even. Um, and that, you know, uh, a lot of your work um, has sort of stemmed from a need and that there's no end to that. So as many people as can come in, put their interest and passion there and sort of go forward, we need as many people to come in as possible, um, as many minds and as many hearts 
uh, to come in. And of course, I should be mentioned that uh, the most powerful thing I think from this conversation is that your own students and your own beneficiaries kind of come in and close the loop and sort of circle back and give back to their community. And you're empowering people to sort of carry this journey. So in a sense, that's a very, very powerful legacy for you all to have not just your own family doing it, but also every beneficiary that sort of comes to you has the power then to take it back to someone else. So thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, I hope, hope to meet you sometime soon. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you.